Uh, hi everyone, yeah, Stuart Lancaster here, just logging in from France, here I am. Um, so as promised, we, uh, Fergal and I, who I'm just going to introduce now, he was the uh, managing partner uh, at PwC for eight years, um, and he's kindly agreed to assist me in this uh, uh, blog, let's call it, uh, of um, my evolution from Lens to, to Racing and the challenges of going, I guess, from a uh from a really successful organization um based in ireland um it's a completely new organization for me in a language i don't really understand very well uh and um a completely new environment and going from a number two to number one position so i put this post on linkedin to try and uh see if there's any interest in people uh understanding the, some of the challenges that were going to happen and uh there's phenomenal interest, really. So we decided, Fergal and I, to do this uh, interview. Uh, and this came about because Fergal uh, actually interviewed me at PwC before one of the international games. And he obviously has been a leader at the highest level for a long time. He asked some brilliant questions. Um, and he's a complete Ruby nerd as well. So it's <laughs> he kicks both boxes. Um, so I'm going to let Fergal lead the way. He's going to ask me some questions, uh, hopefully a combination of uh, leadership questions and and rugby questions about my my past hopefully present and, and future and then we plan to do this uh once a month um so the next one will be maybe the first league game actually in the top 14 for us is now been decided it's Bordeaux uh, on the 19th of August um so we're going to do another one that that month and then uh there's a natural break after the third league game and we'll do another one in maybe September, October time. So uh, I hope you enjoy and I'm going to hand over to Fergal to quiz me. So here we go. Thanks, Stuart. And it's great that my rugby nerd self gets to uh, take control for once. <laughs> um, but uh, can I bring you back, first of all, Stuart, to Leinster? And I remember uh, meeting you pretty soon after you came to Leinster. And I suppose, you know, as a leader and, and looking at you, you got a lot of bad press when England exited from the World Cup. And it seemed unfortunate and unfair that it wasn't just the result of one match. It was the result of one decision to kick for touch where a draw might have got you through to the knockouts and it all unraveled for England. From your own perspective, did it shake your self-belief as a coach as to the fundamentals of what you were about, how you approached culture and values, or had you, was your self-belief strong enough to actually overcome that? I think, I think the answer is yes, because I, I, might, I managed to, to overcome it. I mean, there was a time where you're probably thinking, well, is it, is it possible to get back in the game at the highest level? Um, but I, I felt fundamentally over the four-year period in, in charge of England, that uh, the majority of things we did were, were the right things. Um, you know, we tried to um, build a young team, um, change the the environment a bit, um, change some of the game plans and some of the um, uh, the mindset and the the connection between the team and the country and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, we won sixteen out of twenty Six Nations games during those four years, which you know is a good record by anyone's um, margin. So, so I knew we'd done a lot right. Obviously. Um, you know, the game against Wales um, and then the sort of game with Australia cost us in that particular World Cup. Um, but I look at the coaching team that was with me at the time and the success Graham Rountis had at Munster, Andy Farrell, clearly with the Lions and, and Ireland, um, and, and Mike Katz's assistance, you know, with Andy as well. So I knew we had a good team. Um, I knew the players were on the right track. And uh, unfortunately for me, I didn't get a chance to see it through. And um, but the players did, and they went on to win the Grand Slam and obviously reached the World Cup final in 2019. And Eddie Jones, you know, as, as we know, did a great, great job. So, so for me personally, um, it was it was tough, definitely. Um, there was a fair period of reflection and making mental notes and physical notes of what um, I, was in my control I could have done better or could have done differently. Um, uh, so that period lasted from, say... Well, almost immediately. So I lost the job in November, um, went away, made my immediate, you know, debrief, post-match post debrief as I normally would to myself uh, in December. I know, and then over the period of sort of January, February, March, right the way through to joining Leinster, really, in September, a constant period of reflection and um, renewal, let's call it. Um, so by the time Leinster came and, and asked if I was interested, I was... Ready to, ready to go for sure. And 
you talked about learnings there. What learnings did you have post post England pre Yeah, I, th- I think I think um, it, it's very similar to the situation I'm in now here at um, uh, at Racing in that uh, Racing have been successful, but not as successful as they would like. Um, so they've reached three European Cup finals, but not won one. They won the top 14 in 2016 and not, not won it since then. And their ambition is to win, obviously, Europe and the top 14 as many times as possible. Um, and I'm coming in here and, and I'm trying to sort of reset the culture a bit, um, talk about the identity, what it means to play for Racing. Um, but the priority for me is to coach well, you know, is to get the team playing well. Um, and I guess one of the key lessons for me, and if people are listening, you know, can relate it to your own world. So if my job was split into three areas, leadership, management, and coaching, um, I probably ended up with the leadership piece being 50%, the management piece being 40%, and the coaching piece being 10%. Um, and um, that's not to say the coaching was bad because it wasn't, but but ultimately um, my passion and my deepest skill set in terms of the one that I've done the longest is coaching. Um, you know, going back to 20 years old as a teacher, now 53. So, you know, it's a fair chunk of time teaching and coaching. So coming to Racing now, I've made sure I've surrounded myself with people who are very good at the managerial side of things. So I can delegate um, a lot of the things that previously I would have taken on. I'm not, I'm naturally an organized person. So I'll tend to want to organize everyone and everything. Um, tick my, do my to-do list off before I go to bed at night and then repeat. Um, but now I've, I've tried to put more people in place. And I think going back to the England situation, I do think that um, I could have delegated some of the managerial tasks more, which, which, um, which allowed me more to focus on the coaching and the leadership piece. So then you came to Leinster and it was a good chance, I suppose, to put that learning into action because Leo could do front of house and a bit of the management and you could focus on leadership and, and coaching. So did it, like, how did you find Leinster? Because, you know, it, when you arrived, Leinster had been through a good period, having been second best for a number of years behind Munster. So what was your assessment of Leinster when you arrived? Where were the areas you thought you could bring value to? Yeah, well, I think, I think, I think that I, I felt very lucky in that the opportunity came up because the defence coach uh, left and Leo was already in the head coaching position and Guy Easterby was in the sort of GM position, if you like, and there was already a very good team manager in Ronan O'Donnell. So between the three of them, the management of the, and Charlie Higgins is very good at the, uh, the SNC. So the whole management and the organisation of the team was very, very good when I arrived. So it allowed me, um, by chance, really, to, to fall straight back into a coaching role, which Leo was happy for me to do. Um, so Leinster at the time, I still felt had a very strong culture, very strong identity, great young players coming through. Um, and uh, if you remember, it was 2015, 16. Um, so they hadn't done well in Europe and Leo had just begun to bring some young players through. And I think I think they had a one-one pool game. Um, and then yeah. lost against Connor in the in the final of the Pro 12 at the time. Um was it Pro 12? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Um and uh so I just think they needed a little bit more organized. And I'd spent a lot of my time, you know, thinking about coaching, thinking about game plans, thinking about how to improve teams. Or So as soon as I started watching them, I thought, well, there's immediate things I can see I can improve defensively, which was the priority. So I came in in that mindset. And then as, you know, sort of my relationship evolved with the players and with the other coaches, then we started to work on the attack um, between us. And I brought a lot of things that I'd learned from England, from my time at Leeds, from rugby league, from from all the influences Brian Ashton, all the influences I had in my career, uh, and my own philosophy and my beliefs. So um, that that year was tremendous growth for us as a team and for me personally. I'd only signed for that year, and um, we reached the semi final of the European Cup, lost against Claremont, um, and then we actually lost um, against uh, the Scarlets in the in the semi final. So two semi final defeats were painful, but I extended my stay for two more years and then we did the double the following year. And as again, from your own philosophy and your, you know, I presume you've got a lot of comfort of getting back into real coaching again and almost putting the management bit to one side. Yeah, yeah, I did. And I think, I think probably the lesson there for for people listening is, is the, it was, um, 
uh, a guy called Jim Collins wrote the book Good to Great, a uh, management book. And I actually met him in Denver, in Colorado, before the World Cup. We went on a training camp there and I actually met him in his offices. And uh, he sort of tracked my progress and contacted me after the World Cup. And he said, oh, he's actually a mountaineer as well as a you know leadership guru. And he said, oh, there's always another mountain to climb. Um, so we arranged a, a Zoom call and we had a, we had a, we had a chat. And uh, we started talking about Steve Jobs, who obviously was the founder of Apple or one of the big people involved in Apple. And he got sacked by Apple. And That's but right. then came back 12 years later, and obviously it became what it became. And um, I said to him, What did you do in those 12 years? And he said, Well, he went away and decided what his passion was. And his passion was making products and designing things as opposed to actually trying to manage people and systems and structures. So I think the message there is you can still be a number one and and follow your um your passion and what your ultimate skill set is. And you've just got to be um confident in the people around you that you know you, you delegate the responsibility or you create the environment around you so I was lucky Racing approached me in September last year and it's a very long lead-in for a coach to join an organization normally a coach gets sacked and you get a call and you're, you're in but it's a bit like Leinster you're in within one week but I had a nine-month lead-in and um, they allowed me to sort of shape speak to people and shape the management team the way I wanted it so now that now I'm here, um, I've not actually coached the team yet, so it's weird to see how that goes. Uh, but uh, now I'm here. Um, I feel I've got the right pieces of the jigsaw in the right place to allow me to do what I want to do as a number one in a big organisation. And just to finish on the Leinster bit, Ben, what have you learned, Stuart? You know, because I, I remember talking to you before and you, you almost had you were writing down things that you learned every day yeah. almost kind of if you look back in your period nearly seven years in Leinster what way is Stuart Lancaster a different leader what way is his philosophy different now than it might have been seven years ago well on, on the field I've learned a huge amount uh uh I think by um planning rugby sessions doing rugby sessions reviewing rugby sessions plan do review repeating that cycle over seven years with a club team where it's day in, day out. So the actual physical prepare, pre preparation of a team. Um, obviously, I've learned a lot from the people at Leinster. There's a tremendous amount of IP in the organisation from, from Leo's knowledge to Johnny Sexton's knowledge to Issa Nasiba's knowledge to the other coaches' knowledge and the Michael Checkers and the Joe Schmitz have gone before and all that IP that exists. So I've learned a huge amount from that, from that point of view. Um, I've probably learned as well to show... Uh, the real me, um, because I think the pressure of England um, meant that I uh, probably didn't show ranges of emotion as much as I should have done or could have done. Um, so yeah, I find it very difficult sometimes, you know, managing uh, the players that were getting picked or, you know, all those conflicting things that were happening as a leader. Um, and it was, I found it um, mentally and emotionally exhausting really so my default then was to try and retreat back into my room to re rebuild my emotional battery for the following day um and I think I've been more effective at that at Leinster than I was than I was with England and I think they've seen um a better version um of me um and I'd like to think even though I'm now going to a number one position at Racing I'm going to be this I'm going to be the same you know I feel obviously more experienced um so a lot more confident in my own personality and who I am. Um, so I think that's probably one of the key the key things. Um, but Lens has given me so much, you know, and they were the one that created the opportunity for me to come back into the game and coach rugby again. And, you know, I was very, very lucky to be in the right place at the right time and get the call when I did. So now uh, we fast forward to September of last year and you get a call and it's obviously not the first call you've got over the last six or seven yeah. years. Um, talk me through your, your mental process, because for a lot of people listening, they're good at what they do. They're in a role they're comfortable in. Uh, they can manage it well. And the idea of going to a different country where they don't speak the language to effectively be promoted to the next level, you know, they might say, oh, well, I'm happy where I am. Thanks very much. Talk me through your own decision-making yeah. process in deciding to go for this. Well, I think I think I think one of the key the key factors at the time was 
Um, Racing's approach was good. It was, you know, it was um, impressive. Not, we didn't actually talk about contract length or anything at all, to be honest, but they just said, there is no number two here. We want you. There's no plan B. You know, there are other coaches out there, but we we would we, like you to um, to become the head coach. I'd actually done some consultancy for them in 2016. I think they remembered, obviously, that. And they'd, we'd beaten Racing in 2018. So we'd obviously, and we played, we were going to play them this year in Europe. We played this year in Europe. So um, so I think their approach, you know, in, immediately um, made me think, because Wayne Bennett, the rugby league coach, said to me one time, he says, wherever you go next, make sure you 100% want to go and they 100% want you to come. Um, and so they 100% wanted me to come. And then I had to sort of weigh up my mind, do I 100% want to go? I don't think I was ever going to get to 100% because Lens is such an amazing place. It's like leaving the best club in the world in my mind. Um, but seven years in one place um, and part of the job of a coach is to make yourself um, redundant, um, really. And the growth of the team, the growth of the individual in the team has been so rewarding. The lads who are 18 and now 25, the lads who are 22 and now 29, they've grown from, you know, young academy players to, to international players. And I've coached them for so long now, they can almost, they almost know what I'm going to say before I say it. Um, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Um, it's probably a good thing that they they now own the team. But there was definitely a little bit, bit of me thinking, my time, my time is done here now. Uh, or not done, but... Um, I can move on knowing that the players are in a great place and, that, and there's a great organisation and feel comfortable. Um, but yeah. also, that's interesting, Stuart, in a, in a business context as well, sometimes a new voice brings a fresh input yeah. to an organisation. It'll be different, and you know, and I, I know myself, you know, as, as I've seen leaders come in during the, uh, over my time, a new leader arrives, everybody does perk up a little bit more because yeah, yeah. they're out of their comfort zone. What if the new guy doesn't, you know, rate me? So everybody ups their game a little bit. So yeah. there is a little bit of that as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think I think from Leinster's point of view, that's been a very uh, effective part of their evolution as an organisation. So when um, Felipe Contreperme came in, he left, Andrew Goodman came in, John Fogarty left, um, Robin McBride came in. So... You know, with Jack Neat, a brilliant coach coming in, you know, head coach of South Africa. So, uh, so I think Leinster are in good place. So that was that was part of my thought process. But also, I guess deep, deep down was uh, I was weighing up on my mind. Like I'm, I'm almost at capacity here with the, the job I'm doing and managing um, the commute from Leeds to Dublin, managing family dynamics. You know, son, daughter, wife, mum. You know, brothers and sister, all that stuff that goes on around outside of work. Um, and I know I was going to increase my own capacity by putting myself into this position, which I've done. Um, but I didn't want to sit back at the end of my career and just think, oh, what if, what if I'd have done that? Or, I, you know, I want to, there was a psychologist, Dave Hadford, actually said to me one time, if you retired now, Stuart, would your soul be at rest? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it's a long way from being at rest. So, uh, so the challenge of going to the top 14, the challenge, um, of, learning French, the challenge of an organisation like Russing and trying to improve it to the quality of Leinster, uh, consistent quality of Leinster, um, was probably just too tempting to turn down in the end. Um, so it was a little bit of right time, right place to leave Leinster, I think, for Leinster's uh, development, but also for my own personal development, um, the right thing to do. But it, 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 it probably from, from the approach to me saying yes, um, prior to even any contract tour, um, it probably took maybe three weeks, I'd say. I had a holiday in between time, spent a lot of time thinking about it, a lot of time discussing it with my wife, because obviously she's the one who's had to bring up the the, the children uh, during their A-levels, during university, and we've lived apart for seven years, and we needed to, we need to live together now, and uh, she, you know, and it's fantastic for me to be able to offer her the opportunity to come and experience a different lifestyle, um, and for all our family and friends to come over and visit. So. I needed her to obviously to to be part of the decision making um, and the and the kids as well. Um, so tough decision, but um, eventually I made it. And obviously, the difficult decision point then is communicating the decision to the people who you care about most, which is the players and the and staff of Leinster. So that was difficult. Um, I found that very difficult. Um, but that was done in September, and then we obviously cracked on during the course of the year, um, and. You know, I said my goodbyes. Um, 
But I'm hopeful, you know, I'm in Paris now. They're going to be hopefully, well, they will be here for the World Cup. So it won't be the end of the relationship with all the players and, and the people. And I think I said when I left, you never know, I might, might come back, you know, in the future. That's interesting because, you know, when you talk about your soul being at rest, you 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 would go back to Leinster, but, you know, you're, you're, you're even if you never went back, you'd be happy with your time, what you did at Leinster. Would you go back and do the England job again? Uh, I think I left in different circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so that, that, that changes things a bit. Um, I think there's a great young group coming through. Um, like my, my son, Dan, um, he played for in the 20s. And that age group, I do think is a brilliant um, age group coming through. Um, I think if you ask my wife, she, she, might, she might question my sanity if I said yes. Um, there's probably other 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 parts of the world I'd love to coach in as well. You know, the Southern Hemisphere would be a big challenge for me. I'd love to go and try and uh, coach in Super Rugby, you know, in, in some way, shape or form or or even international be down the Southern Hemisphere. Um, uh, so you'd never say never, but but I think it's it's not top of the list. And certainly I think Steve Bolton will keep the job till 2027. I'm committed here till 2027. Um, so let's see. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a no, but it's not a yes. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's it, no, I don't, you know, I don't think you should ever say, I don't know. I don't think, yeah, I don't think you should ever, not, not that you should never say never, but I don't think you should ever be so uh, hurt or, or or damaged that you can never go back somewhere. Um, if, if if the political will is there, if the, the moment and the time's right, and, you know, um, I'd, I'd hate to be so hurt and uh or angry about certain things that I, it would stop me doing certain things you know i don't want to be that kind of person would, would you uh, sorry if just to take that in a bit i've read a couple of interviews now with english coaches and they've referenced you as somebody they talk to or so you've become a, a kind of a mentor figure for some of the younger english coaches coming through how did that evolve well i guess it's the natural evolution of coaching you know if you look at i don't know if you study the american football coaches then they coach players who become coaches and um, you create this sort of like family tree, like this, <laughs> this, was the, this was the head and then two coaches came from there and then they coached these players and they became coaches. And um, you look at Bill Belichick and these, these sorts of guys, they have these Bill Walsh, the sort of family tree behind Bill Walsh. Um, and if you took, say, Brian Ashton, for example, yeah. he'd be above me, you know, and then I'd be, that'd be here. Uh, and then um, uh, I, the coaches you're talking about, the guys who are coached, who are England Saxons, England players, uh, Leeds types players, um, or even if they're not necessarily players I've necessarily coached with England, they know that I've I've done I've coached at every level of the game in England. Um, so you can you can ask me about under six coaching, and I can talk, talk about I've talked about under tens under. 16s under 18s, university rugby, um, uh, schoolboy rugby, um, Saxons, age grade rugby, premiership rugby, championship rugby, international rugby. So, so I, I, and um, I'm always willing to sort of help anyway. So I guess the push, no, the push, the push, the push the door when they get contact, but I do find it rewarding. I do find it yeah. rewarding. And I do think that part of what makes me, what motivates me is helping people get better at something. Um, so, so I'll find it very motivational to come to wrestling and try and help them try and improve. Um, I'll find it very motivational to do my coach development session for the coaches in the Parisian area um, uh, to help them get better at coaching. Um, uh, and so the mentoring of young coaches, young English coaches, you know, I'm not going to turn around and not mentor them because they're English. Um, uh, but I would say... There's as many in Ireland and in other countries as well. It must be the teacher in you that yeah, enjoys the conveying of that. I, yeah. I, I always remember when Leinster played Chile there last year in the world. I remember going into the clubhouse afterwards and you were sitting down with the Chilean coach and you were walking him through parts yeah. of the game and moves. And I, I just watched you there for about five or ten minutes and I, I thought it was fantastic. It really was. And you were, well, you I, mean, were I, I still, I, I had a Zoom call with him maybe... Four weeks ago, so they're going to the World Cup, obviously. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and he's he's panicking a bit. Um, 
<laughs> so I'm trying to help him. Um, I would speak to um, Levin, the Georgian coach. Of Sandra Goodman's gone to work uh, with Samoa and Goody and I were together, you know, well with Leinster and the list goes on really, I guess, of the um, the, the people you speak to who you, you try to help. I've got, I've got two on Sunday night, two Zoom calls on Sunday night with two different coaches. I've got one tonight. Um, I've got another one tomorrow. And that's probably a little bit of the challenge for me, like as the, as the day job, I'm on the cusp of the day job really kicking off. Like making sure that the main thing's the main thing. And, and let's talk about the day job. So as an outsider, I look at wrestling and I think, oh, in the 80s and 90s, there was a glamour club wearing the bow ties and drinking champagne at halftime. And then they moved into the pro era. And, you know, you still got this impression of a sort of a Galactico club. They bought Johnny Sexton over. Then they got Dan Carter to replace him. And yet the trophy cabinet isn't exactly overfilling they've won top 14 in, in 2016 they were runners up three times in the last seven years in the the Heineken Cup um looking at the stats this year they finished fifth got to the semi-final the top 14 is going to be in the, the Champions Cup this year but two things jumped out at me when I looked at the stats for last year the highest scoring club in the top 14 by nearly 50 points and uh, more than Toulouse and um sure. uh, Lyon and yet, what the other thing, the only clubs that conceded more points than the <laughs> were, were, were Breve and uh, whichever other club got relegated. So thinking, no, no, there's Breve, Breve and Perpignan who were second bottom. Yeah, so you, you sort of look at them and say, okay, the attack coach is doing something really <laughs> well. Maybe the defence coach needs a bit of help. But what's, what's your own assessment? As, as I, I think a lot of Irish people will take a lot more interest in, uh, and of course, sorry, Ron Nogara spent some time there as well. But yeah. I think a lot of Irish people and, and English people will take uh, more interest in wrestling this year. What's your own assessment as you look at the club? Yeah, no, I think, thank you for the nail on the head, really. Um, they've obviously got a very strong attacking mentality, which suits my philosophy anyway. You know, that's the way that Leinster would play. Um, I think there's a lot of improvement that I could make in terms of detail of attack, quality of attack detail, um, both from phase play and in, and in strike players as well. Um, defensively, clearly massive on that word to do. Um, I mean, the challenge is going into a new organisation is where do you prioritise? You could sort of look at everything and try and change everything in the first week. Um, the reality is pre-season starts, um, so we're on Thursday now, um, and pre-season starts next Wednesday, so in six days' time. With three and a half weeks before the first um, uh, trial game, um, warm-up game, two warm-up games, and then the league starts in mid-August. So, you know, there's 101 things I could start to do, but probably not achieve any of them. So, so the priority for me in, in like the classic first 100 days is I've been lucky in that I've arrived in France. Um, this is maybe eight days into France now. So I've been lucky I've arrived. It's allowed to get my feet on the table from a pure living perspective, actually, like, getting into a house, working out how to drive on the wrong side of the road, getting to training, finding where this shop is, um, organising Wi-Fi and just usual stuff when you move abroad and getting into the office. And a little bit, I was thinking about this, actually, I was driving driving here today, um, um, getting into the office at the weekend when no one was there. I don't know if you found this yourself, but the ability to visualise what it's going to look and feel like in the, in, in, in the quietness of a weekend was actually really useful for me. I needed, I just needed time. I just need time to think about what I'm going to say, how I'm going to say it. Um, I've asked lots of good questions, hopefully, and tried to get as much information as I can about where the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, my first meeting um, with the management team is on Monday. Um, and I'm going to ask them, you know, give me some words that describe Russing now, give me some words that you want Russing to be known as. So quite simple stuff, but just to engage them in conversation, make sure it's not just, me, you know, monotone telling them what the vision is going to be, um, but by engaging them early in the in the in the meeting and then using my own um, ability to try and to try and paint a vision for what I see as the future being, but bringing them with me, not so, not not completely directive, but more more directive than empowering initially because they need direction, and the same with the playing group, you know, the same sort of principles. Um, on Wednesday and then we're, we're then very quickly into not just the environment the culture the identity the, the where were we last year where do we want to go what's the future look like but um, but also okay let's get on with improving the game plan 
and you know you're again for people listening in business so you're parachuted in with a new management team who you've never worked with before unlike many others who uh, in management who know some of the people how do you go about building that glue Stuart and, and, and kind of creating that that shared vision and values about where you want to go over the next 12 months yeah well again I was, I was probably lucky in that the September appointment gave me a few months to arrange you know zoom call in an evening um, I got we had a week off so I got over for a day spent a day with what was going to be the new coaching team um, cause it was the people I needed to sort of recruit and appoint. Um, so I allowed them to sort of build the philosophy. It was advantageous that Racing played Leinster. So they got to see Leinster firsthand and they obviously saw, um, how good Leinster were, um, in those particular games. Um, so not push an open door, but they were open for change. And you know, the challenge for me, um, it's, it's a completely French coaching team. Um, but I have brought two people in, um, a general manager who's worked in France for 25 years and the head of SNC who's worked in France for eight years. But both of them were, um, I know from previous jobs. So that's definitely helped the transitional period. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's common sense, but it's, it's easy to skip it in that you're asking good questions, spending time with them, making sure you're not rushing conversations and creating time. And I've, I've been lucky in that, I've arrived, I've had eight days, but the players haven't been in. So I've been able to build slowly and ask questions without feeling like we're having to rush to get everything done. Um, so I think, take, I, think taking, I think taking your time when yeah. you first go in is really important. Yeah, and, and that, it was great to hear, you know, you're, you're, you're not imposing your view or your vision on them, but you're, you're trying to arrive at what may well be a shared view, but hugely influenced by you. But if I asked you to sum up, you know, what what would you like people to say about racing in twelve months' time or twenty four months' time? You know, what are what are the adjectives? What are, you know, what are the things you'd like to, them to? Uh, well, I'd like to I'd like to think they can see improvement. Number one, so it's very sport is very binary. Really, you can see improvement, not not necessarily just on the scoreboard, just in terms of the cohesion and the organisation of the defence and the attacking systems and structures. So I I, I would like to see um, improvement. I'd like to see um, uh, a high quality professional environment where the behaviours are not dissimilar from what Leinster were, like humble and hungry. You know, there's a real hunger and a desire to want to go and win, but a hum humbleness about we don't know all the answers and we're not going to proclaim ourselves to be the best in the world when we're not. Um, so there's, 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 but there's a confidence and an inner belief built on strong foundations of the way in which we train has given us this this confidence and belief that we we can go and play that the, the best teams in, in France, obviously, uh, to start with, and then in Europe. Um, uh, and those habits that we acquire in training stick in the, in, in the biggest big games and the, and the, and the highest of pressures. So uh, I think I get, there's good people there. There's no doubt. I'm not, I'm not concerned about... And I wouldn't have gone in the first place, to be honest, if I felt it was like a toxic culture that was never going to be able to be solved. And I think that's set by the owner. The owner, Jackie Lawrence, is a family man. You know, he wants the right things. And um, they're actually, I know, I know to us from the outside, like Racing's brand um, is huge, but yeah. actually, and the Defence Arena is amazing, but the actual um, engagement with spectators and with um, the community is probably not as strong as you'd think, you know. So you might be talking an average crowd of 12, 13, 14,000, you know, not rather than anything beyond that. And I think that could really improve that connection and that building of that relationship with the, the community in, 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 in this area, because Paris is a, it's a massive city. It's like London, obviously. Um, and it's, there's lots of competing attractions. Um, Stade Francais, one being a rugby team, but Paris Saint-Germain is a huge soccer team. Um, and obviously the, all the cultural and everything else that goes with, with Paris. So it's not, you know, Paris is not the heartbeat of French rugby. The Southwest is the heartbeat. Um, but I need to try and create this heartbeat in Paris. So I'd like to think if someone came back in a, in a year's time, you'd see greater connection with the fans and a growing sense of this is actually a very strong, powerful club team that's emerging. 
do you see kids wearing racing jerseys the way you'd see kids wearing Leinster jerseys around Dublin? Yeah, well, the amazing thing, Fogel, is, is that actually I was watching out my window and there was racing under sixes and racing under sevens and racing under eights. So there is, there is, um, there is that, but but there is no um, rugby played in schools at all. Wow. There's no, there's no, there's no sport played in school. So so school finishes on a Wednesday lunchtime and then the sport is done by your community clubs or whatever. So you might have an occasional P lesson, but not, you know, we'll talk about like yeah. the Black Rockers, your maps and Michaels and, and the, 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 the Leinster Schools Cup. There is nothing like that um, wow. that creates the sort of, the conveyor belt and the interest, you know, through the families. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do in that area. But again, I go back to this sort of, Keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing, if you if we play well and we play attractive rugby and good rugby, um, then uh, sorry, um, the then um, then the uh, then I think it'll build. Do you know what I mean? But I think it's a long way from being um, where it could be. But, I, but I'm sorry, the main thing the main thing being being I need to make sure I coach well first. Yeah, can't get too distracted by building the community connection. Da da da. Yeah. And, and interesting when you were talking about what you want from the team, resilience is something that struck me because, you know, every week when you look at the top 14 results, it's not guaranteed, but you can really bank on every game being a home win. And if you look at Racing's uh, uh, results last season, you know, 14 wins, a draw and 11 defeats. And nearly all the defeats were on the road and nearly all the wins were at home. What is it uh, do you observe at this point about French rugby that, gives the home team such a psychological edge and even teams down near the bottom playing teams you yeah. know in the top third still they fancy their chances of turning them over at home yeah i, th- I, th- I think the the historic the history the history of the clubs i mean the ones the teams that have got such a strong supporter base that the expectation is they they have to win at home you know if you're a player then so they 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 take their game up 10 percent, and the opposition tend to subconsciously take their game down 10% by assuming they're not going to win anyway. So part of the reason I've arranged two away pre-season games is to take them away from home and change this mindset. Uh, but you're right. I mean, I remember I was looking at the league table close towards the end of the season and the team that was in third place had lost 10 games, I think, or nine games. And, you know, it's a... But Leinster, if we lose one game, it's like <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I just can't get my head around the thought of losing 11 games next season. Um, so I don't want to actually entertain it. So I'm not going to. So I'm just going to like keep driving on and drive them to hopefully to have the mindset to win every game and not uh, not allow subconscious complacency to creep in because, you know, we never win away from home. Well, you never will win away from home if that's the mindset. And how do you coach for that, Stuart? How, how do you, do you, do you, kind of put it on the table as an open issue and yeah yeah oh no no I mean I think I think you'll probably I mean this is the challenge for like you and I can have a conversation now for 45 minutes um and uh we can articulate the points we want to make I'm trying to put things like that on the table but I'm trying to do it in French (laughs) Badly, badly in French um so if you're saying to me what what's that, I mean, I, so yeah, I will put it on the table and I will be pretty, not blunt, like rude blunt, but I'll be like pretty, uh, I'll give my point of view, I'll give my point of view, and but also some solutions I think that we can do to, to help become more consistent, starting with attack, defense, you know, et cetera, et cetera, coaching well. Um, but my biggest challenge is almost, communicating that everything the vision the mindset the resilience the game plan it's the ability to communicate that well um to a group of which 70 percent of french 75 percent let's say french of of that 75 i'd say 50 percent of that 75 don't speak much english at all so there's always gonna have to be a third party until i get better at the language um as a translator so and and talk about that challenge Stuart, because at one level, you know, rugby is a universal language, but you're right, to communicate at the highest levels that you're doing requires that, that, that French. I mean, 
uh, how big a challenge is it for you? Well, I'll give you an example. So I met, so I met, um, I'll give you two examples actually. Um, Bernard LaRue was a second row South Africa yeah. was at Racing for 15 years and just retired. So I had a really interesting 20 minute conversation with him about his time at Racing, you know, what he learned, gave me some really good insights into the organization and obviously talked a bit about his family and everything else. And then Cameron Walkie walked in, he was just about to go into French camp to do some, some training. I had a million questions for Cameron Rocky, but I couldn't ask him any of them. Because there was no one there to translate. Bernard LaRue had gone, and I was like, bonjour. <laughs> so, so, so that's a real worry, not worry, but it's a limitation at the moment for me. Um, how am I going to round it? Obviously, I've just got to be more effective. It's probably not a bad thing for me, actually, as a leader, because I would tend to want to not over talk, but I'd want to get my point across, and I probably could do it in four sentences, not eight. Um, so I think in France, I'll have no choice but to do it in four sentences because I can't, you, can't, you can't have a meeting that goes on for an hour because you're always having someone translate. It adds half an hour to the, to the meeting, you know? Mm. Um, so, so the priority obviously is learn the language, but in the meantime, it's to be short, be succinct, be to the point um, uh, and use non-verbal communication and body language as a, as a as a as a really important point, and perhaps more so than ever would have done. So, like I met um, the club captain today. Well, I, he didn't know he was going to be the club captain, but I told him he was um, Henry Schwansi, and um, uh, he's been there for a bit like Eastern Sea with Johnny Sexton of, of Racing, been there forever. Um, and uh, I really wanted to like make him feel proud to be asked to be club captain and. Everything else, and obviously, I felt I conveyed that, but um, I'd have a third person in the room to to communicate the conversation. And sometimes a player just wants to know: is he getting picked? Is he not getting picked? Is he getting a contract? Is he not getting a contract? So, but the players are everyone is is keen to embrace um, an English speaking head coach. That I don't get the sense of any resentment that I'm not French. Um, but then again, I've only started, so we'll, we'll work on it. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But um, it, it's, it's rare. I mean, Ronan, obviously, is head coach at La Rochelle. He, he uh, I didn't realise how long he spent at Racing, actually. He arrived in 2013, 2014. He was there, like, for, I didn't realise it was long, four or five years. Then he went to Crusaders. Yeah. So he got that good grasp of the language, and I think that's really helped him going back into, into La Rochelle. Um, um, it's probably a more sensible way of doing it than I've done it. I was, you couldn't, as you say, you couldn't turn down the job. Just yeah. a question, and it's as much a business question as a, as, a, as a rugby question. How do you then, with your currently limited knowledge of French, you've got a squad that has New Zealanders, South Africans, Georgians, French, Fijians. How do you make sure you're not biased towards those players who you can communicate effectively with? Because they yeah, have good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I've, I've, picked, I've picked the um, leadership groups. I've asked around a lot. Um, uh, of the coaches, I said, if you were to pick a leadership group now, who would they be? So I've taken a straw poll from everyone, and I've gone like there's different ways to pick leadership groups. Um, and I guess this is I guess this is your management team, but I've gone with the youngest player, uh, some the young, six young players. Um, wow. uh, when I say young, like 23, 24, um, and um, they're all French. They're all French, oh. so there is no bias there. Um, yeah. Obviously, when when um, C. Cleese comes in, um, he'll, he'll add leadership value. Gail Fico will add leadership value. He comes back from the World Cup. Um, so these sorts of uh, these sorts of guys will 100% add value after the World Cup. But at the moment, it's a brilliant window to give young leaders opportunities for growth because the yeah. senior so there's 10 senior players who are in the World Cup um, training camps and obviously in the World Cup. So uh, I don't think that I don't think that'll be an issue for me to be honest. Um, uh, I've got to try and learn the language, you know, um, and really embed myself in the French. And obviously living, you know, in France all the time now, it's been a real eye out of the difference already between, you know, living in Ireland and Dublin for seven years, living in England before then, and now living in France for eight days. It's, t- <laughs> it's t- like they have like their evening meal at, uh, I was running around to a friend's house. I had like my, my, my evening meal at half five, six, Went around to the friend's house and his wife um, and friend and I were having a drink. We got to 8.30 and I'm thinking I'm just going to go home now and get ready for bed and uh, get up in the morning and go to the gym, whatever. 
She said, oh, I just wonder if you want to stay for food. I'm like, what do you mean? I ate like two and a half hours ago. She's like, what? <laughs> you ate at six o'clock. <laughs> I'm like, what time do you eat? She says, it's nine o'clock. I was like, what oh, time do you go to bed? Yeah. So, anyway, just little things like that. And also, you know, even like I went out the other night and uh, I'm looking for, like I, I'm from, I was in, uh, well, Rath Mines on the border, you know, on Randler really. Uh, and I'd get up, I'd walk down and I'd be in McSorry's and there'd be like 10 pubs on a row, wasn't there, in, in Randler and loads of restaurants. I walked down into So and Plessy Robinson. I think there's one tobacco shop. <laughs> and then there's one, one what you call a bar, um, a couple of restaurants, and that's it. Everyone's, everyone, everyone socializes at home. Completely different. Um, so you get your chicken wings and try back at in. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. And so it's going to take a bit of adjusting too, but uh, I'll find a way. And just that, that you know, I know when I took over as leader of PwC in Ireland, uh, initially I wanted to be at every dog fight. I wanted to see how everything worked within the organisation. Before then, I was able to withdraw and say, OK, I don't need to be here because I've got good guys or gals running it here. I need to focus more time here. Are you able to, at this stage, because you've got less time, are you able to be disciplined to say, I've, I've appointed a management guy. I don't need to get involved there. Or, or do you, are you needing to get your hands into everything starting No, 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 no. I've definitely learned that lesson. Like, I've, I've learned that lesson. So uh, I'm a lot, lot better now at saying, um, and someone, like, someone will ask a question, do you, do you want to get involved in this? I'll just go, no, no, no. You just come back to me, you know, let me know. Like, what's the media strategy? Um, engage with the commercial partners. Um, uh organization of the weekly schedule and um, there's a meeting about the top 14 structure like lauren to do that a uh, recruitment of players like well that's his job over there um you know what i mean so um uh snc bobby can deal with that you know the the head of snc the doctor seems very good so no just just definitely um lessons learned from trying to um being be over be over everything it's 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 just important i don't have the um capacity yeah. to to do that anyway because i'm trying to think think in english in, in, in english language and trying to think how's this going to operate how i'm going to say this in french or how am i going to so that takes a lot of cognitive like yeah. thought processes so you have to you have to yeah let, let them get on with it there's, there's plenty of good people at racing you know they're very well-run organization so it's not like there's um loads of things that need sorted out there's, there's lots of good people and yet you, you've gone from being a number two now to be the number one what are the things you're going to be doing in racing that you you weren't doing at leinster like what sort of tasks uh i'd say obviously the main the main one is that like the final decision on selection rests with me um uh, the final uh the accountability rests with me um like Leo and I very much worked hand in glove together. You know, we were, we were very, very close. But ultimately, it came down. You know, Leo was the one who had to. If we won a game, I lost the game. He's the one who has to front the media. And um, if there's a conversation we had about contract, is he staying? Is he going? Leo's ultimately the one that had to have that conversation, and that's that's now my job. Um, but a lot of the responsibility Leo gave me at Leinster um, is the same responsibility I have here. Um, so, so I'm. I'm there is some change, but it's probably not as big as as you'd think. But the the big the big test is still to come. You know, we've not played a game of rugby yet. You know, everyone has amazing pre seasons, and you know, we've got three league games. And if we've won three and lost none, then I'll be happy. And if we've won none and lost three, then I'll be really be thinking, "Geez, I'm a game away from getting sacked." So it'll be on a knife edge at some point. Soon, well, very soon in in less than six weeks' time. And you talked about when you were in England, it was 50% leadership, 40% management, 10% coaching. D define your, 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 your uh, time chart. I would down. say 50% coaching. Great. 40% leadership, 10% management. Okay. And, and that would suit you a lot more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. 100%. Um, so, yeah, I've just got to coach well. I've got to coach well. I've got to improve them. Like I've had little, lots of little mini meetings with um, the players aren't all back in yet, but I've managed to catch up with yeah. key players and explain the philosophy and show examples of Racing's player last year versus how I want to see them play um, and change the calling system. So in rugby, obviously, the framework, which you're attacking framework, 
um, requires a specific language. I'm not sure it's the same in business. I'm sure it is to us. Like you've got a specific language that people can adapt to and can understand straight away. And then you've got freedom within the framework. But that language, that common language, has to be something that everyone understands. And I didn't understand their previous language. Not that it was just in French. It just didn't make any sense to me. Okay. And so it was all. It was almost like an, uh, an accumulation of calls from ten from ten years of. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Important. So, so it's, it's I've changed everything in terms of that regard, the calling system. Um, so now, or even if you've been at, if you're Henry Shimonsi, you've been at Racing for 10 years, he has to learn a new calling system completely. Um, I've changed the office, so it's now open plan. Uh, we've changed the gym. We've changed the uh, meeting room. Um, we've changed the weekly schedule. So the weekly schedule is different. So there's a lot of change and... Obviously, I've done my best to try and pick off the senior leaders before senior players before I've done this to explain the reasons I'm doing it. And it's not, you know, a criticism of last last year or whatever. It's just the chance to do something different. But I think they're ready for it, really. Like a bit like we talked right at the very start of the conversation. Like the previous coach and the coaching team had been to, been there for eight, nine years, you know. So I think there's a newness that the players are looking forward to. Yeah. And the World Cup, I presume, is a giant sort of distraction to your early phase where ten, you were saying 10 players won't be around. You've got to reintegrate them come uh, November. Yeah. Uh, just is, I presume you're used to that from your Leinster days, but at the start of your career as a number one coach in France, it, it must be an impediment. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, yeah but again, I... I, I um, Leinster does give you a very good ground in that regard. So, and the players we're talking about are top end, top end players. You know, it won't take. And I've, it's not like I've not spoken to them before, before anyway, before they've gone into the World Cup camp. So, you know, the key men I've I've chatted to, um, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll get my all my meetings videoed. Ah. So so um, that they'll get uploaded, and if they've got spare, which they will have a bit of spare time, they can watch. And just get get a feeling of what's going on, you know, at Racing, even though they're obviously preparing for the World Cup. Because with the best one in the world, you, you don't train every day in in, in the lead up to a World Cup. Um, so, and then when the actual World Cup happens itself, um, it'll be great. It's, you know, it's in it's in Paris, isn't it? It's in France. Yeah. So I'll be in the middle of it, and it'd be great to to spend a bit of time because we've got no games. With hopefully, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the island coaches, in particular, and the island players. But there'll be many many people around and, and the challenge for me then really is make the main thing the main thing keep my eye on the main thing you know not get distracted by the world cup because i still should be i'm coach, i'm coaching russin i'm not i'm not there to go to the world cup in fact i've got no tickets for any game so um so i'm, I'm sure really, you get started <laughs> i know but I'm not, I'm not really it's not really on my mind to be honest i'm not, I'm not really planned to go i'm not i'm happy to i'll i'll, I'll watch them all um you know, I'll download them and watch the four views and I'll study all the evolution. I'm intrigued by which team plays in what style and what lessons I can learn as a coach. And, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll hook up with coaches. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so I think, I think, I think the challenge then is the reintegration piece, but hopefully with, you know, they can watch stuff and they'll reintegrate depending when they get, when they finish around about, as you say, end of October, November time. And then there's four games in November. Um, and then the Champions Cup starts in December. But I mean, the difference, one of the big differences is there's 18 league games in the URC and there's 26 in. So, the, so what we're on now, we're on the 6th of July. The final of the top 14 is the 29th of June next year. <laughs> so it's a full year nearly. Yeah. It's a full year. It's a full year from now. So anyway, we'll be able to chronically, uh, what we'll do once a month, we'll be able to chart the progress. I, of great. There was a thing you said earlier there about you know when when that Leo when you were number two Leo had the team selections and all this you know I'm I'm thinking about that your ten stars come back and you've had some young guy who's been knocking it out of the park for it, it, during the World Cup and you've got to go and tell him sorry you know Khaleesi's here now he's going to have to play you know how do you manage those discussions because we're you know it, we're very good at giving positive feedback yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Given telling the young guy or you know who's who's done really well that no actually he's he's back off and he, how what do you, how do you yeah I mean I think, I think, I think well bad news should never come as a shock number one 
Um, so there has to be a preparation period to say, listen, and you know, the, the reality is when these players come back in November, um, the team will constantly get rotated between November and the end. The big conversation happens at the end of the year when they were in the hopefully in playoffs and then it's the best team and you, you're picking the best team. Um, um, but again, whether it's whether it's uh, giving a ladder um, a message about listen, I need to give this guy an opportunity. He's just won the World Cup with you know France. He's coming back in, so we need to give him a game. Um, but you think you've done brilliantly, um, uh, and I'm going to give you another opportunity, good chance to have a rest and um, have a bit of reconditioning or whatever else. So the way you sell it and where you package it, bad news should never come as a shock. So it should like the the preparation piece. I think is important. Uh, how you how you prepare the players or prepare someone for something that's not maybe they're gonna they're gonna like that much, um, but it's not permanent. It's not like it's a permanent thing. It's not permanent. This isn't a permanent. Uh, you're never gonna play again because this guy's playing. It's it's yeah. it's 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 only as permanent as you make it. Like one of the things that I found interesting in France. So they announced the squad. To, they announced the team to the players in Racing um, on the Thursday and the Friday of the week. Uh, and that's late to prepare if you don't know if you're actually playing or not the, the game plan um, so I'm going to change that and announce it on the Monday um, and all the players in France are like Oof, well. uh, you'll find that the players aren't getting picked won't try as hard on the Tuesday and I, my message immediately was if they don't try hard on the Tuesday then they won't play the following week they won't play the following week after that either so they've got a decision to make you know I don't want this sort of like toys out the pram because I've not got picked you know I want the determination to prove through training that I should be picked and you know that's that's the mindset we should all have because if we train hard then that will give us the foundation to play and win under under pressure um if you slack off in training because psychologically you're not in the right place because you're feeling sorry for yourself then you're in the wrong team but what what do you do to the player who having been selected on Monday thinks not going to risk injury now. I'm going to, you know, my, my play. Well, he'll he'll get away with it for a week, but he won't get picked again. <laughs> for a week, for a week. So, um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, that, 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 that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in, in, in way, well, not in the environment I've been in. Yeah. And the, um, the uh, World Cup you mentioned coming up, can you enjoy a game of rugby if you're not, in, can you watch two teams play and actually enjoy it for the theatre that it is? Or are you constantly, you know, analyzing and yeah, no, I'd be, I'd, no, I'd be, no, I'd be, I'd be, yeah, no, I'd enjoy it. Obviously, you'll enjoy it, you know. Um, but I'd, I'd be studying it. I'd be studying it. Um, and then I'd, I'd notice little things. I think I need to go back and watch that again, just to, just to really capture the learning. I actually want to take a clip of that moment because that's exactly what good looks like or whatever. So, um, but it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, rugby is such a uh, a sport with so many different ways of winning the game um, and there's so many grey areas in the, the referee decisions or the bounce of the ball or the, the you know the look um, that you need sometimes to win a game so um, yeah it'll be fascinating it'll be fascinating but um, it'll all be for me about studying about what I can do to get better myself as a coach and trying if I do get a chance to speak to some coaches asking them questions about How's preseason gone? You know, what's your mentality about this? How do you feel about that? Just, and we're I'm conscious we're getting near the end of our, our time, but you've been a coach at national level, you've been a coach at, at club level. Preferences? You know, I'd say club at the moment. Um, I actually genuinely yeah. really enjoy the day-to-day, week-to-week. Like, international rugby is amazing. Like, the highs are super high, the lows are obviously not, not great. Um, but, um, uh, there's 10 games a year and there's lots of the brilliance of international coaching. You get a really good window in between events to personally develop and your chance to allow players to shine on the highest stage is very, very rewarding. And your chance to make a difference to the game, I think is, is, is really rewarding part of the job. Um, so there's definitely huge positives to international rugby, but actually Top end club rugby, you know, when you're playing against your La Rochelles and your Toulouse's and wherever else, um, it's as close to, if, if not the same as top end international rugby, when you look at the players playing and the quality of the coaches. So um, so it brings that pressure. But I actually genuinely enjoy, I enjoy this window now without the rock stars being at Racing because we've got the young players who really probably never had an opportunity at Racing because the philosophy's been a little bit more about taking... Um, 
yeah, giving the senior players opportunities. Whereas I think the young players at Racing are starting to push their way through now, a bit like they did at Leinster a few years ago. And uh, they're the ones, that's why the leadership group is driven, will be driven by them so that they can um, drive drive the culture and own it. So hopefully in four years' time, if if and when I leave, if that's if that's when it is, then I've developed a young French coaching team who are like early late 30s, early 40s. And uh, um, a playing group that's 22 that will become 26, 27. And again, you'll be sort of hopefully in the place that Leinster are now. So finally, we'll talk again in a month's time. What does success look like? Ignoring the results on the pitch, I know you can't, but you know, in, in, in a month's time, what would you love to be able to say? Um, I would say that um, the new the, the new changes that I've made have been adopted in a in, in a they've been adopted well and they've been a um, a positive response to the changes that have been made to the to the gym to the office space to the way meetings are conducted to the um, the way reviews are done to the um, the way training is conducted so that'd be one um, number two um, I can see a genuine improvement in the quality of the performances on the training field and there's a genuine commitment from the players to to want to get better by using training as the vehicle rather than just assuming it's natural talent or some sort of like, okay, just happens. That's you know? interesting. So That's they've really drawn interesting. a line between preparation and performance, um, and that the uh, that I've been able to communicate effectively my vision for the game, my leadership philosophy, my coaching philosophy, not necessarily in French but through a translator, uh, effectively in a, in a, in a uh, and I've I've navigated any difficult chances that might come my way in an effective way. But I'm sure there will be some. Yeah. And if all that goes well, well, the score will take care of itself. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the, that's 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 the theory. But the, there's plenty of good teams in France. Um, Bordeaux's first up. Um, so Noel McNamara, who was at Leinster, yes, he, he's he's at Bordeaux. So um, I know him well. So. Um, so Bodo home, Perpignan, um, sorry, Poe away, Perpignan at home. That's the start. Okay, not a, not a bad start. No, 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 no. But um, I'm not going to say that online because uh, <laughs> all the Bodo, Poe and Perpignan fans, someone will get hold of it and say, you yeah. <laughs> know, they're all, they're all every, everyone will make me nervous, to be honest. So um, let's, let's just go okay. one game at a time. <laughs> Okay, well, look, Stuart, uh, we, we, we'll talk in a month and hopefully those markers would have been reached. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Virgo. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Uh,